I knew that I was going to borrow money, pay it back with interest. And that was pretty much about what I knew about it. I've always saved my money. My, you know, my money is my money and I don't have to think about, you know, paying, paying college debt anymore. All that money is mine. Americans carry more student loan debt than any other country in the world. While more people are going to college and college costs are rising, there's another side to student loans to consider. Without realizing it, you're about to make one of the biggest financial decisions of your life. It's very rare that a 17 or 18 year old is really thinking seriously about what they want to do with their whole life. Most kids don't really have a good grounding in what we call financial literacy. For most teens, student loan debt might not even seem like real money. It was in now and it was money that was accessible right then and there. It was, it was a fortune to a college student. But without a plan to pay off those loans, a lifetime of trouble may lie ahead. I would do whatever I could to make those payments, so I did second guess my career choice a lot. Whenever something seems like it's free money, it's not. There's some cost somewhere. Just ask the 25% of borrowers who have defaulted on their loans. And the other 75%? Well, some of them aren't doing so great either. From 2009 until my first child was born in 2018, I worked seven days a week. My biggest concern of student debt that I've seen now for about 20 years is the thoughtlessness that goes into it. That doesn't mean it's always the wrong thing to do, but too many are doing it and jumping ahead without a really thoughtful process. Saving for college should be something that should be thought of in advance and not just determined senior year of high school, how are we gonna pay for this? Should you borrow for college? If so, how much? It's a decision that takes planning and can affect your post-college life more than you think. Before you take out any loan, it's especially important to know what you're getting for your money and how you plan to pay back that loan. I had no savings because it was all going to pay down debt. But I also didn't think about my future, like putting money away. Jessica is an elementary school teacher dealing with the real life consequences of having taken out a large amount of student loan debt. As a junior and senior in high school, she was faced with a situation in choosing a path that millions of students face each year. You meet with the registrar and the bursar and they talk about how much money it's gonna cost and all these things. Um, so the ride back that seven hours was very quiet because it was like, how am I going to do that? I didn't have savings going into college, so student loans were my only option. Students often borrow money to pay for their living expenses in college, but many students find an unwelcome surprise waiting after they finish their four-year degree. So after I graduated my undergrad, I couldn't find a teaching job. There was a plethora of teachers, so we couldn't find jobs. I decided I didn't have kids, I wasn't married, so I went right into my master's degree. I had to actually take out another student loan to continue my education. So in my mind, I was looking at, okay, so if I have to pay back all this money, I might as well make as much as I can. And that total debt for four years of an undergrad education and a master's? I owe $132,000. That's when the student loan debt became real money. I'm making these huge payments why isn't my, my principal going down? Um, and so I added it together and that was a really big like eye-opening moment. Like this is how much I actually owe. It was a lot of stress. I was like, I'll never be able to buy a home. I'll never be able to not live paycheck to paycheck. I don't know how I'm going to afford such, long, such large payments in the long run. I didn't know if I was going to have a family or if I always was going to have a second or third job because I had to pay these bills. Taking out tens of thousands of dollars worth of student loans is not your only option. Just ask Mike, who took a strikingly different path. Went to college for about, I don't know, one semester, and I said, I can't do it, it's not for me. So uh, I then came home and my dad's like, well, better get a job. From there, Mike began a journey to find something fulfilling as a blue collar worker. Just saved up my money and um, you know, bought a car and then from there on, I just tried to find anything to better myself. After a few years of building skills and proving to be a reliable worker, a friend called to offer him a job as a construction laborer. And he's like, hey, you wanna come work for us? I just fell in love with it. You can't be lazy, you can't be, you know, you gotta want it. And it was just, 
it was it was perfect. It was just perfect for me. And it was just nice because it's like I don't have to think about, you know, paying paying college debt anymore. And it's just all that money is mine. But what happens when two paths that seem to be leading in different directions merge together? I mean, he knew I paid bills. And he knew I worked a lot because that's, I mean, we didn't get to go on dates on those weekends. We, he would visit me at whatever establishment I was working at. And that's how we kind of spent time. It was going through my mind quite a lot to tell him why I had to work so much and why we couldn't just be a normal dating couple for a long time. It was just tough because, you know, now her debt is my, you know, our, our problem. And you got a home, you got a cars to pay for, you got other things on top of this. But at the same time, you know, I got to help her out, you know, so yeah, it was tough. Having that conversation was very nerve wracking because I didn't know how that would change our relationship or if he would be like, yeah, that's too much money. I'm sure he went home thinking like, what did I get myself into kind of conversation. She, she's a very hard worker. So that's what, uh, that's all I really cared about. You know, she was going to school, she was, juggling two jobs and stuff, and it was just like, it was, it was nuts. Even with two household incomes and nearly a decade of paying on her debt, the end still isn't in sight. Fortunately, I do have a low interest rate and I'm starting to see that principal go down, but th that's gonna be a very long time until I can start making larger payments on that loan. So I can't even tell you the light yet for that one. Each year, hundreds of thousands of high school graduates like Jess borrow money for college without understanding the cost. To understand the difficulties you may face in paying back these loans, first, you have to understand the one force that's working against you while you're in school and deferring payments. Compound interest is a sort of mathematical concept where the debt is growing if the interest is being added to it. And so each month, the actual amount you owe can be going higher because not only is there the amount of money you owe and then interest, but then that compounds on itself. It adds over time. The average student loan debt per borrower is about $40,000. So let's say you borrow $10,000 per year for four years. Your student loan payments were deferred all while you were in college. Six months and one day after you leave school, whether you graduate or not, your first payment comes due. Now you start paying off that 40K, right? Not exactly. So the interest clock is ticking, even though you're not making payments. It's ticking fairly because that debt was paid out. The money had left the lender to go to the college. The college got paid while you were there. And so the good thing is you didn't have to make a payment while you were still a student, but the bad news is that the interest throughout your four years was accumulating. At an interest rate of 7%, that $10,000 becomes $10,700 by the time you start school the next year. Borrow another $10,000 in your second year and the interest keeps ticking. Another two years of college at this pace and $40,000 borrowed, becomes over $47,500 owed. And all of a sudden it really snowballs into a big financial burden. And then one maybe does start earning more money, feeling in a better position professionally, and yet all of that gain and all that excess, that reward is going to relieving a debt burden instead of actually being able to get ahead financially. You should only borrow what you'll be able to pay back based on your starting salary when you graduate. Are you willing to have half of your spendable money um, go to the debt? And, and it, it's gonna mean that you're only going out this many nights a week, or you're only you know, having this kind of financial freedom and, and frame it around a hypothetical and allow them to turn the knob up or down as to what might be comfortable. In order to determine if college is a good investment upon entry, you have to think about what is it that I'll be doing upon exit. Using our example from before of taking out $10,000 per year gave us a total of $47,507 owed after interest. What would those student loan payments look like? To pay the balance of that loan, you'll need to pay $550 per month over the next 10 years. But because compound interest keeps building, you're actually paying $66,000 between the ages of 22 and 32 not your original 40000 Even if you earn more money with a college degree, a big chunk of your paycheck will go toward paying off that loan. 
But there are things that you can do, like researching available scholarships and grants. If a student would spend 100 hours of time to look for scholarship opportunities, write essays for those scholarships, submit the applications, and come away with one scholarship for $2,500, the student might be disappointed at first thinking it wasn't worth it. But if they take that $2,500, divide it by the 100 hours of time they spent, they just made $25 an hour. As an 18-year-old, you're not going to find a job that's going to pay you $25 an hour. So it becomes well worth their time. Work-study programs at college or a part-time job may also help reduce your cost. Between scholarships, grants, and a job, what if you could cut your student loan in half, from $10,000 to $5,000 per year? Your total amount owed drops significantly from $47,507 to $23,750. That's still a lot of money, but your monthly payment drops significantly to about $234 over that same 10-year span. And the total paid with compounding interest? Just over $28,000. Some borrowers can't even afford apartments and have to move back home after college to make ends meet. More than half of millennial renters say they cannot afford to buy a home due to student debt. But there are other options than a four-year college degree. And I started with the premise that college for all was my mentality. But it turns out for many young people, potentially direct entry into uh, industry maybe something that is uh, more attractive and more relevant to their particular setting. And so what we want to do is create opportunities, particularly in K-12 to uh, schools and high school, that you have this idea of dual pathways. I do believe that the decade ahead is going to lead to a lot more two-year programs, vocational programs, trade schools. There's been a kind of stigma attached to some of that. I think that's going to go away. Trade schools and community colleges offer significantly lower costs for students. In a perfect world, where would you like to be? Would you like to be, would you like to start a family? Would you like to own a home? Would you like to have uh, not only an undergraduate degree, but a graduate degree? Whatever your aspirations are, let's reverse integrate from that 10-year goal. And usually we can connect the dots between what you want to exist 10 years from now, five years from now, to two years from now, to help you make the decision today. Let's take a look at 10-year plans for four different students ready to graduate high school at age 18. Lila has decided to become a lawyer, which means four years of undergrad and then three years of postgraduate work. Ryan is going to school to become a teacher, four years of undergrad work. Antonio has decided that he wants to work with his hands and will go learn a trade. Maya isn't sure what she wants to do and will just go straight into the workforce. Lila's career choice involves a significant investment. Law students, on average, leave school with a debt of $145,000. After her undergrad and three years of law school, she'll enter the workforce at age 25, facing a monthly student loan payment of $1,600 for the next 10 years. Ryan needs a four-year college degree to become a teacher, and he'll enter the workforce at 22 with $47,500 in student debt. That leaves Ryan with a $550 student loan payment until he's 32. Antonio is going to a two-year trade school. He'll enter the workforce at 20 with $10,000 in debt and could be through paying his debt before Ryan and Lila even graduate college, if he's able to pay more than his $100 minimum payment. Maya may make less money than the others, but if she saves just $100 a month, she could have money for school when she has a better idea of what career she wants to pursue. As you can see, income is the most important factor in determining how much you can afford to borrow. When making your plan, remember to look at starting salary, not average salary. The starting salary is closer to what you can expect to make right out of school in your first job. The average salary takes into account everyone working in that field, whether you've been on the job 25 days or 25 years. Then what other expenses will you have other than student loan payments? Things like housing, food, transportation, and entertainment are all part of your budget. You'll have an idea of the type of lifestyle you can afford to live after graduating. Oh, I've seen student loans benefit borrowers when they come out of school having grown intellectually, grown emotionally, 
uh, come out of the college experience with a very positive experience that's prepared them for real life. And the amount of debt they've taken on is serviceable. They're going to work hard right out of school, have the cash flow, the incoming income to service that debt and, and ultimately grow their income into the future. So college is an investment, much like purchasing a home or starting a business. And sometimes you have to spend money in order to make money. Most student loan trouble comes when the degree doesn't pay for itself with higher earnings or if you don't complete your degree at all. If they don't complete the degree, they don't have that earning power that they would and wouldn't have the opportunity then to repay their loans as easily by having a higher salary. And if they don't understand how much they've borrowed, they can just get themselves in a lot of debt without realizing. Aside from traditional schooling, there are even apprenticeship programs in certain industries which pay you to learn on the job. Others reimburse a percentage of your schooling if you are a student while you work there. Maybe you feel like the military is the right choice for you. Depending on how long you serve, the GI Bill can cover up to 100% of your college costs. There are countless routes you can choose after high school. No one solution is right for everyone. It all depends on what you want to do and what makes you happy. But I think there's a high pressure that has led people to make decisions that were really quite uh, irresponsible. But let's presume you choose the college route. Six months after your last class, your loans come due. It's time to start paying your debt. Repayment comes with many options, but which one you should choose depends on your own situation. When a student borrows, they should consider um, repayment plans that will meet what they are able to afford to repay. A good rule of thumb when borrowing is don't borrow more than you'll make your first year in your career, otherwise you'll struggle on your repayment. If you can't pay your loans, there is an option, but it should be avoided at all costs. Putting your loans in forbearance. That means you don't need to make any payments at all for a set amount of time, usually six months, but it comes at a cost. More interest. Compounding interest. What it does essentially do is run the clock higher, run the, the um, ultimate till of what you're going to have to pay, and it pushes out the age that you're going to be when you've finally been relieved of that debt burden, it pushes it out further. Let's go back to the first example of ending college $47,507 in debt. Putting your loans in forbearance for just six months tax on over $1,500 more in interest alone, which means higher payments than you had in the first place and a higher total paid over time. What happens if you make no payments at all? If you don't make any payments for nine months, your loans will go into default, and then things go from bad to worse. Aside from being hounded by daily collection calls, your wages could be garnished. Garnishment means the payments are taken directly from your paycheck, or even from your tax refund, whether you can afford it or not. And your credit score goes down the drain, making it hard to buy a house or a car. Student loan laws discourage bankruptcy because otherwise high-earning professionals like doctors and lawyers could go to school for years and never pay a dime, leaving taxpayers to foot the bill while the new graduates might go on to make millions of dollars. You took the loan out, and you are the one who's responsible to pay it back. A lot of people, especially at a younger age, they don't know what their financial flexibility will be in terms of their producing, but they do know that they can control their consumption, whether it's student debt, auto debt, credit card debt, they have choices they can make to give themselves more flexibility. And ultimately, flexibility can bring a lot more flourishing. The purpose of this lesson is not to scare you away from college or taking out student loans. It's to show you the very real consequences and things you need to consider before taking out your student loans. Combining loans with a few other techniques like part-time work and scholarships can not only lessen or eliminate your debt, but it can also provide valuable experience. Look in your area and see if there are community colleges where you can take your core classes that will transfer credits to the college you want to attend. Community colleges are usually cheaper and as long as the credits transfer, you can save thousands of dollars by doing this. Once you're ready, you can attend a more expensive college, focusing only on the courses for your major. It actually can be much more fulfilling to go through the process of paying off the student debt, knowing that you responsibly contemplated what it would look like. That process of thinking through things 
and being prepared for what can happen. It can lead to just a much better outcome emotionally and financially. It's frustrating. It's definitely it's definitely kind of like a smack in the face because I should have been building this wonderful nest egg or this great savings account and all that hard work. I worked seven days a week. I didn't even get to enjoy any of my time. So it was taking that money and paying off loans and you, it was the responsible thing to do, but it, there was no fun in it. You want people to chase their dreams. But see, you limit your options when you have a certain debt burden attached to your financial reality. I definitely would have had a part-time job, saved that money from high school. I think that with student loans, it's important to understand what you're signing, what you're taking, how much you're spending, and what you can truly afford to pay back, and also what lifestyle you want to live. But I also don't want to discredit that I had a great college experience. Um, I just didn't realize how much it was going to affect my adult life. But I do think people that are maybe going to study something uh, that has a less professional aspiration or, or less earnings potential attached to it, that's okay. We want poets and, and artists and, and whatever the example may be. Philosophers need an education too, but they have to at least do the homework, uh, do the assessment of what the debt will look like relative to earning potential. Student loans can seem overwhelming, but it helps to make a plan. First, look at what you can realistically expect to make once you enter the workforce. Second, calculate your cost of living, depending on where you live. Third, figure out what your student loan payment will be after you graduate. And finally, look for ways to reduce the amount of loans you need to take out. Even if it looks like your budget may be tight, at least you know what to expect. Start looking for any scholarship opportunity that you can find Talk to whoever at your school receives the opportunities for local scholarships. Oftentimes it's the high school guidance office. Get on the internet and do searches for scholarships. Get on scholarship search engines where you create a profile so that you can get email opportunities to you and take the time to apply for the scholarships. Remember, when you sign for that loan, it's up to you to pay it back. And the lower your payment, the less financial stress you'll have after graduation. Thinking about these things right now gives you an advantage. You're making an investment in yourself and your future. Make that investment pay off.